Nothing can separate Even if I ran away Your love never fails I know I still make mistakes But you have new mercies for me every day Your love never fails You stay the same through the ages Your love never changes There may be pain in the night But joy comes in the morning When the oceans rage I don't have to be afraid Because I know that you love me Your love never fails The wind is strong and the water's deep I'm not alone here in these open seas Your love never fails The chasm is far too wide I never thought I'd reach the other side Your love never fails You stay the same through the ages Your love never changes There may be pain in the night But joy comes in the morning And when the oceans rage I don't have to be afraid Because I know that you love me your love never fails You make all things work together for my good You make all things Work together for my good. You make all things work together for my good. You make all things work together for my good. You stay. You stay the same through the ages. Your love never changes There may be pain in the night But joy comes in the morning And when the oceans rage I don't have to be afraid Because I know that you love me Your love never fades There's no other name by 
which I am saying, won't you capture me with grace, and I will follow you. I will follow you. Come to my rescue. Tell me where else can I go? There's no other name by which I am saved. Won't you capture me with grace? And I will follow you. And I will follow you. This world has nothing for me. I will follow you. This world has nothing for me. I will follow you. This world has nothing for me. I will follow you. This world has nothing for me. Cause I need you, Jesus. to my rescue tell me where else can i go there's no other name by which i am safe won't you capture me with grace and i will follow you and i will follow
Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. See you high and lifted up, and shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing, Holy, Holy, Holy. heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Won't you open the eyes of my heart? I want to see you. I want to see up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love, as we sing holy, 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 see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love, as we sing holy, holy, holy. See you high and lifted up And shining in the light of your glory Pour out your power and love As we sing holy, holy, holy See you high and lifted up And shining in the light of your glory Pour out your power and love As we sing holy, holy Holy, 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 you are holy, 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 and I want to see you. Thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. And for His good, He is above all things. His love endures forever. We'll sing praise. Sing praise. With a mighty hand and outstretched arm. His love endures forever. For the life that's been reborn, 
His love endures forever. We sing praise. We sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. And forever God is faithful. Forever God is strong. And forever God is with us. Forever and forever. Forever God is faithful, and forever God is strong, and forever God is with us. It's forever, it's forever, it's forever. From the rising to the setting sun, His love endures forever. And by the grace of God, we will carry on. His love endures forever. We sing praise. We sing praise. We sing praise. We sing praise. Forever God is faithful. Forever God is strong. Forever God is with us Forever, forever Forever God is faithful Forever God is strong Forever God is with us It's forever, it's forever, it's forever His love endures forever, His love endures forever, His love endures forever, His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. with us forever 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 God is faithful forever God is strong forever God is with us it's forever forever it's forever So we will return to our study in, in the book of Numbers today, and, and uh, we'll start in, in Numbers chapter 10, if, if you're turning there. And we, we've just taken a two-week pause for, for uh, Palm Sunday and the, and the Passion Week, and uh, if, if you can remember back three weeks where we were last in Numbers, uh, we've, been, we've been studying for a couple of lessons, and through the first six chapters, we've seen that after God had worked with the nation of Israel for two solid years to camp there at the base of Mount Sinai, that he then had, the, he was ready to move them to the promised land. And he, so in preparation, he had them counted. That's the, the name of the book, Numbers. It was the numbering of the people. And we come to chapters 7 through 10 that we'll cover this morning. And after finishing this, all this preparation of these people, uh, we'll, we'll see that in these chapters, they finally begin to move. Number seven, one says, And it came to pass on the day that Moses had fully set up the tabernacle, finally the tabernacle is fully set up, and had anointed it and sanctified it, and all the instruments thereof, both the altar and all the vessels thereof, and had anointed them and sanctified them, that the princes of Israel, heads of the house of their fathers, who were the princes of the tribes and were over them that were numbered, offered. And they brought their offering before the Lord, six covered wagons, 12 oxen, a wagon for two of the princes, and for each one an ox, and they brought them before the tabernacle. 
So this chapter 7, is, is there's a lot of detail. There's a lot of detail in chapter 7 numbers. In fact, it's the second longest chapter in the Bible. So at the conclusion of building and erecting the, the tabernacle, uh, God's really, really got these people, I don't think they understand where they're at in the moment, but he's got them ready themselves for a journey and ready, getting ready to go to the promised land. So, so what happens here is a representative, that calls them the 12 princes, a representative from each tribe, uh, they brought offerings to the Lord. And as we just read, there were, as you know, there are 12 tribes. Uh, in total, the tribes provide six wagon and, and 12 oxen, or two, two ox per wagon. Uh, this was important. This is an important gift because the Levites who were in charge of the tabernacle were going to use the oxen and the wagon uh, to transport the tabernacle and its furnishings as they moved. Now, that, that would be true for all except for the, the family of Kohath. They, the family of Kohath, they were Levites also. If you remember, they are tasked by God for transporting uh, the Ark of the Covenant and some of the other furnishings of the Holy of Holies, and those aren't going to be loaded on their wagons. They were going to put the gold staves in the rings, and, and those things were to be carried. So that family would carry it. Next, each, each tribe was to bring dedication gifts to the tabernacle. They, they, were, they were dedicating the tabernacle. Now, I don't know if you've realized before, as we've been reading, uh, back at, through Leviticus, we saw all this detail, all this detail of how to make the tabernacle, you know, down to the buckles and, and the skins and everything. And, and I, I think as we read these things, we don't, we don't grasp maybe what God was tasking these people with. But what, what you discover at this point is it's taken them two years to get all this stuff together. They had to get all the fabric together for the walls of the outer court. They had to make lamp st stands of gold and uh, fashion all this stuff. So, so, that's why we've just read that after two years, a tabernacle was finally erected that they've been working on uh, making all these implements to the detail that God had given them. So the tabernacle was erected, and, and for the next 12 days, we read that each tribe, each a tribe a day is going to come forward bringing uh, gifts, uh, dedication gifts for the tabernacle. And this, this whole chapter, chapter 7, gives you detail of what each tribe brings. And when you read it, and I know you'll read it because you're Bible reading people, that you'll see that, that each tribe brings exactly the same things, that, that it's even. They bring, they duplicate. They bring the same things. So that's chapter 7. Chapter 8, uh, you get into chapter 8, and you see, again, the tabernacle is just erected. You see that the lamp... The lamps are finally put into the lamp stand inside the tabernacle, and, and they're finally lit. Now, as we've went through Leviticus and, and we've been looking at this tabernacle, we've been talking about how everything of the tabernacle foreshadows something later, foreshadows something that we can even relate to. As you read chapter 8 and you read about them setting the lampstand in its place and putting the lamps in or the candles in, we think not this candle but an oil candle, that they had to be so arranged that, that the lampstand itself could provide no light in the tabernacle, could provide no light in the tabernacle unless the lamps were properly positioned in the lampstand. Now, now thinking of that, you go to Revelation uh, chapter 1 verse 20 and and there, you learn something about the representation of the lampstand. You learn something about what the lampstand foreshadows. In Revelation, it tells you real clearly that the lampstand is a picture of the church. And there's a foreshadowing there. That the lampstand itself can provide no light, that it takes candles to provide light. Provide light. So, so we can see in our day that the church being the lampstand, that the church is an implement from which the light of Jesus should be shining into the world. Let me say that another way. The church is only a lampstand. 
It's only a lampstand. You. You are the candle in the lampstand that light should be shining out from you into the world that you live in. Into your conversations should be affecting people you know. Just, just as Misty shared with us before service started, that she saw some students being lamps to another. They belong, no doubt, to a church which is a lampstand. They themselves are candles shining the truth of Jesus into the world. Next in chapter 8, you, you read that God required some ceremonial cleansing of the Levites before they started to work in a newly erected tabernacle. You, you might think, well, you know, we read all these details a long time ago, but here, they were details. God was saying, this is the plan. This is what we're going to do. This is what you're going to make. The Levites are going to be priests. Now we're getting to the doing. Everything's in, finally in place. Uh, but, and I say that, clear back in, in chapters 8 and 9 of Leviticus, uh, the priests, the Levites were dedicated to the service of the tabernacle and, and the priesthood. Now in this chapter, everything's in place finally, so the Levites are being dedicated to that service. They're being dedicated to the Lord. They're being dedicated as his possessions. If you remember, he, God had first claimed the firstborn of Israel because of the death angel passing over and saving of the firstborn from that plague. Then we more recently read that God exchanged he traded the Levites for the firstborn. Now, now the Levites are him. And you remember the, at the numbering, there were more, more of the firstborn than were Levites, so God implemented a tax so that the trade was fair and equitable. God's always fair and equitable. So in this chapter, they're dedicated, the Levites are dedicated to God's possessions. And you should see something in that. You should see... I think, I think here's where church misses it a lot. Think about leadership, thinking about how these Levites were to be the priests. You should see that it's important that a pastor not only be dedicated to his church, but more importantly, but that he be dedicated to the service of God. And if you ever change churches, if you ever find a need to be somewhere else, that's a tool that you should have in your toolbox. Where is the pastor's dedication? Is he only dedicated to growing a church and creating wealth? Or is he truly dedicated to the service of God? And that will help you. Numbers 8.10 says, And thou shalt bring, bring the Levites before the Lord, and the children of Israel shall put their hands upon the Levites, and Aaron shall offer the Levites before the Lord for an offering of the children of Israel, that they may execute the service of the Lord. The children of Israel shall put their hands upon the Levites. So, so what we, you have here is, is kind of a public, a public ordaining of the Levites for ministry. And this was so all of Israel, you know, God had already determined that the Levites would be a priest, but it's been some time. And so with this activity, with this presentation, all of Israel would understand that the Levites are dedicated to God, that they're submitted to God, that they, their role is that of priest. And that this would be a continuing role for them, that they belong, in fact, to God. Numbers 8.24 says, This is that which belongs to the Levites from 25 years old upwards who will go in and wait on the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. But at 50 years they retire and there is no longer a service, but they will minister with their brothers in the tabernacle of the congregation to keep the charge. So it, God kind of defines the ages that they'd be actively serving as priests. Uh, that after the age of 50, they weren't. You know, this, I, th I think we, we read about the priest in the tabernacle, and we, we, think, of, we think of this. This is not, this was not what it was. I, I take you back again. To, this was heavy lifting. This was endless sacrifice, endless slaughter of animals. So God said, said once they, the Levites became 50 years old, they, they wouldn't be doing the heavy lifting anymore. They would still be ministering to people. They'd still be in the tabernacle. They'd still be praying to God and doing the, that kind of stuff. But, but their activity with the heavy lifting of the slaughter was, was done. Uh, 
Turn to chapter 9, and we're moving right along. Chapter verse 9, 1 says, The Lord spake to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the first month of the second year after they were come out of the land of Egypt, saying, Let the children of Israel also keep the Passover at his appointed season. In the fourteenth day of this month at even, you shall keep it in his appointed season, according to all the rites of it, according to all the ceremonies thereof shall you keep it. And Moses spake unto the children of Israel that they should keep the Passover. And they kept the Passover in the fourteenth day of the first month at even in the wilderness of Sinai, according to all that the Lord had commanded Moses, so did the children of Israel. So here God restates to Israel the importance of keeping the Passover. He states, he states to them that, that the keeping the Passover had to be kept at the appointed time. It wasn't just something you did whenever you felt like it. You know, thinking of communion, the Lord's Supper, uh, we, do it, we do it at some times, and other churches do it at another time. Some churches do it every week. That's okay. But the Passover is very specific to a specific time and a specific event. And God, God is telling these people at this point that, you know, they've been free of Egypt for two years. For two years, they've been camped at the base of Mount Sinai. And they're about to move. And in moving, they could, they could get to thinking that everything's going to be different now. The Passover was something that we did while we were camped there at Mount Sinai and out. We're going to the promised land. Uh, that's not something we have to do anymore. But God here, just before they move, he tells them, you're going to keep the Passover. It's going to be an annual celebration forever. That I always want you Israelites to remember how I freed you from bondage, how I liberated you, how I brought you out of Egypt. And, and you continue reading this chapter, you see that some men come forward to Moses with, with a problem. That the pa Passover had come and and they had been ceremony, ceremonially unclean and unable to take part in the Passover. Numbers 9, 7 says, And those men said to him, we are, we are defiled by the dead body of a man, wherefore we are kept back, and we may not offer an offering to the Lord at his appointed season among the children of Israel. So what, so what should we do? That we're supposed to keep Passover every year, but yet because we've touched a dead body, we can't come to the tabernacle and and we're, we're in, a, in a serious situation, Moses. What, what should we do? So they did do anything they could. They, they, they did just that. They went to Moses, and, and Moses didn't know what to do, as you read. So he, he goes to the Lord with the problem. And, and basically, I think, I think Moses says, is, is, Dear God, here's the problem. These, these fellows have touched a dead body, and, and by your laws, they... They can't come to the tabernacle, but by your laws you say you have to. So, so what? What's the solution? Or what? What happens if Passover comes and they're outside of the country? They're outside of Israel. What's the solution? So God, God made provision for that. That He made provision that if a person uh, was out of the country, they could celebrate. Passover, not in the first month, but in the second month, that uh, that would be okay. That would be acceptable for them. But then he adds that if someone fails to observe the Passover, even if it's a stranger who is in amongst Israel, when the time comes, just out of neglect, just out of not caring, uh, that that person is supposed to be cut off from the camp. That if they're that disobedient, then and kick them out. Now let me let me let me say that stands true today. Stands true today, and maybe a little bit different different context. But I would say today, if if there is is someone in the church who falls out of fellowship with God, that's by not observing Passover, people were falling out of fellowship with God. They were becoming disobedient. And even today, if, if someone in the church begins to turn their back on God, begins to fall out of fellowship, you need to cut them off. You need to cut them off. And that sounds harsh, but uh, 
those things are contagious. That disobedient attitude can affect your walk if you participate with it, if you listen to it. You need to cut them off so that they can realize the cost of what they're doing. It comes real close to, uh, in the New Testament, when you, when you read of what church discipline is supposed to be like. That if someone falls out of fellowship with God, falls out of fellowship with the church, just have nothing to do with them. Let the world have them. Let God deal with them. Then, if I had a drummer, I'd have a drummer right now. Boom, 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 boom. In chapter, I'm sorry, in verse 15, everything's in place, and they move. Israel finally begins to move. It says this in Numbers 9.15, Now on the day that the tabernacle was raised up, the cloud covered the tabernacle of the, tent of the testimony from evening until morning. It was above the tabernacle like the appearance of fire. So it was always. The cloud covered it by day and the appearance of fire by night. Whenever the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle, after that the children of Israel would journey. In the, and in the place where the cloud settled there, the children of Israel would pitch their tents at the command of the Lord. The children of Israel would journey at the command of the Lord. They would camp as long as the cloud stayed above the tabernacle. They remained in camp. So these people never knew. As they were about to journey in the wilderness, they would never know when God was going to move. They had to always be ready. They had to always be ready. And that's a place where there's an awful lot of people who, even today, miss out on being used by God when God would use them. Because when God's ready to act in their life, they say, well, it's so inconvenient for me right now. That I feel like God's wanting me to do such and such, but it, it's just an inopportune time. But I've got other plans. I've got other things scheduled. And so God, God moves on. They dig in their hills and they pull against God. And the activities of these people in the wilderness, we see how we should be, how we should be, that when God moves, we should move. When God stops, we should rest. And that should be the cadence of your own life. Israel was completely dependent on God for their movement. When his cloud would move, they would move. When his cloud stopped, they would stop. This is, this is what we should be striving for, that we be that dependent on God in our own lives, that when he moves us, we move. When he lets us rest, we rest, and we go as he directs us in all ways. And we heard testimony this morning. It's encouraging to me that, that people are moving as God directs them, and God is directing our paths in this place, and that's why we see so much being accomplished for the kingdom, I think. These people moved as God moved. They let him lead them every day. Yet we have already seen and will continue to see that the nation of Israel was prone to rebellion. It's born into sin, they were prone to rebellion. I don't know about you, but I, I, I begin reading about these things, about Israel and how rebellious they were. They had God's direct presence. And you could think maybe it's so amazing that God tolerated them. That's amazing, an amazing act of grace that he continued That every time they failed, the, Israel, the people of Israel would fail, God remain with them. And, and I don't know about you, but I know about me, and that's encouraging. Because I'm not always obedient. I'm not always successful. And, and you should take that encouragement too when you stub your toes. When you're, you're looking back and you think, I can't believe I just did that. God, I need you to forgive me. That you can look at, at this and see, God stays with his people. Jesus said, I would not leave you, nor will I forsake you. You just got to keep running back to him. When you fail, you need to run back to him or lock your arms around him. 
You read about all the disobedience of Israel, and perhaps you think, I, I really don't know why God just didn't wash his hands of them. Well, you have to understand some things. You have to understand some things about who God is. You have to understand what was going on here. I think you have to understand that if God would have walked away from Israel, it would have required that he not keep his word, that he not keep his promises, that his walking away would have required him to break the covenants that he had made with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. If he walks away from you, he would have to break a covenant that he made through Jesus Christ with you, as long as you're staying in him. If God didn't keep his word, if God doesn't keep his word, then God's not perfect. If he's not perfect, then he's not God. So you can depend on him. But there's a bigger picture that we're studying here, a bigger picture. If God would have walked away from Israel because they were disobedient, he would have been walking away from the pure bloodline of humanity, walking away from his plan of salvation for mankind, walking away from our only hope of redemption. It wasn't only about these people in the wilderness. It's not only about you. Now, if you remember, we've already looked at some of the rebellion of these people in the wilderness. And in an earlier time, God had proposed to Moses another option, that he could raise up another nation of pure bloodline people with Moses as his father. It was back in Exodus chapter 32 and if you're a homework doer, you'll see that's your homework. Go back and look at that. God was angry with the Hebrew people. He proposed to Moses that you, you can be the seed of a new nation. You could be the seed of a new people of the pure bloodline, the pure genetics. And Moses said, have mercy. Have mercy. But you, in trying to understand why God didn't just wash his hands of these people, you have to understand something, I think, even about love. To understand why God just didn't walk away from these people, you have to understand something of love. You have to understand that God gave men and angels both free will because he wanted to love and he wanted to be loved. And I've said over and over and over again, there cannot be love if there is no choice. And once you've chosen to love someone, you love them for better or worse. Did you hear me? Once you've chosen to love someone, you love them for better or worse. Love is not an emotion, it's a choice. You choose to love somebody. It's something that you have decided to do. People don't ever fall out of love. When love fails, it's because someone has gotten selfish and decided to stop loving. They decided at one point to love, and at another point they have decided to stop loving. It's not an emotion. So why did God stick by these disobedient, disobedient people of Israel? Because he decided to love them. That love was and love is the glue that binds the creator to the created. And we see that what God was doing wasn't just about these people in the wilderness. It was about all of humanity. It was about populating the eternity. It was about love. Well, when you pick those glasses up and, and put them on, it looks totally different. You look past the disappointments that these people were causing to God and you see beauty. You see forgiveness, you see grace, you see love.
so as, as we continue in numbers, and we're going to see Israel being disobedient over and over and over again, and we see God sticking with them, even through all their disobedience, we'll know that it wasn't about Israel. His sticking with them wasn't about Israel. It was about who he was. It was about God's character. It was about the pure bloodline. It was about delivering Jesus Christ to the world through this bloodline, through these people. Chapter 10 starts as, there, as the movement is beginning, starts with God telling Israel how to fashion two trumpets of silver to communicate as a means of communication throughout the camp. Think about this. There are over 2 million people that are moving. How, how do you communicate anything over 2 million people outside? You know, we're, we're used to electronic communications, and they didn't have that. So God has them fashion these two silver trumpets, that would, and, and he told them the method for communication using these trumpets as they pro- traveled to the promised land. You know, you take these trumpets away, that, this is nearly impossible. You know, you might have 500,000 people start walking this way and 500,000 start walking that way and nobody knows what anyone else is doing. Maybe not even in view. Two million people cover a big area. Numbers 10 and 11 says, And it came to pass on the 20th day of the second month in the second year that the cloud was taken up from off the tabernacle of the testimony and the children of Israel took their journeyings out of the wilderness of Sinai and the cloud rested in the wilderness of Paran. After two years of preparation, after two years of being prepared by God for this short, fairly short journey to the promised land, if you consider what had happened to these people over two years' time, they had been ordered, they had been organized, they were cleansed, they were purified, they were set apart, they were blessed, they were taught how to give sacrifice, they were taught how to function as priests, they were given Passover so they could remember their liberation from Egypt and how they were spared, how they were delivered, how, 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 how they were prepared in all these ways. These people had God's immediate presence in the form of a cloud by day and fire by night as a guide. And you would think after all this extensive preparation that has transformed these people who were slaves into people destined for the promised land, that this 11-day walk from Mount Sinai to the promised land should have been a piece of cake. Should have been a piece of cake after all this preparation. But we'll find out it wasn't a piece of cake. We'll find out that all this preparation was exactly that. It was preparation. That ahead of them laid the great challenges that they would have to meet in faith. You know, think, think of it in terms of, of military. Think of it in terms of a boot camp. A young man who goes through boot camp, when boot camp is over, thinks that he has finished something thinks that he's accomplished something, but all boot camp does is prepare the soldier for the greater challenges that lay ahead. Israel had just been through boot camp. And this is exactly why a weak gospel, it's why a weak gospel does so much harm. This is why the come to Jesus and life will be easy gospel is so destructive. It's why you hear me so often preach against the emotional altar call, the unsupported emotional altar call. Why you hear me preach against saying, just say this sinner's prayer after me, you'll be saved. Weak gospel, empty gospel. We're called to make disciples, not instantaneous converts. We're called to take people through boot camp. We're called to train them up. We're called to educate. We're called to bring them into a relationship with Jesus Christ, not just come emotionally and say this prayer. 
And again, go live the rest of your life like heathens believing that you're saved. And the church has just helped them into hell. The church has just punched their ticket. I don't think that's the business of the church. Some of us were just talking, where in the Bible does it, are you instructed to lead somebody in a sinner's prayer? Where in the Bible does it say every week, have an altar call and try to count the number of people that you got saved? Ask me how many people I've gotten saved, I'll tell you none. Jesus Christ saves, I don't. Ask me how many people I've led to Jesus Christ, I'll tell you, I don't know. I hope at least one. But I do the best I can in teaching what God would have you to know. The weak gospel is so destructive because as soon as someone makes one step towards Jesus Christ, we have someone here who has experienced this, Satan's going to come and try to convince them that they're making a mistake. The soldier who never went through boot camp at the first sign of resistance will throw down his weapon and run away. The Christian who makes an empty profession of faith, who has no weapons, who's not been discipled, who's not been through the boot camp of church through sound biblical teaching, at the first sign of resistance will throw down the spiritual weapons that we have and they'll run away and they'll run right towards hell. And the church has helped them if they've not been careful. Numbers 10, 28, thus were the journeys of the children of Israel according to their armies when they set forward. So they begin to move, and they begin to move in the way that God had ordered them, each tribe with its own army, led by the tribe of Judah with the flag with the lion on it. We know Jesus Christ came as the lion of the tribe of Judah, leading the way. In verse 29, it says, And Moses said to Hobab, the son of Ragu, the Midianite, Moses' father-in-law, we are journeying unto the place of which the Lord said, I will give to you. Come thou with us, and we will do thee good, for the Lord has spoken good concerning Israel. And he said to him, I will not go, but I will depart to my own land and to my kindred. And he said, Leave us not, I pray for thee. For as much as thou knowest how we are encamped in, in the wilderness, and thou mayest be to us instead of eyes. It shall be, if thou go with us, yea, it shall be. What goodness the Lord shall do unto us, the same we will do to thee. So, so this Hobab is a brother-in-law of Moses. He's the son of Ragu. Uh, when you first read of him, his name was presented as Reuel in Exodus 2.18. We, I can't hardly say those things. I'll just say Jethro. <laughs> as an old watcher of the Beverly Hillbillies, Jethro <laughs> makes sense to me. So Moses, he's, he's a son of Jethro. Uh, if, if you remember... Jethro first came to Moses back in Exodus chapter 18 when, when Israel was arriving at Mount Sinai. If you remember, Moses at one time had tended Jethro, his father-in-law's flock, at Mount Sinai. This is where these people live. So now two years later, the nation of Israel is ready to move. They're starting to move, leaving Mount Sinai. And here's Hobab, the brother-in-law of Moses. And, and Moses recognizes that this is a man of the wilderness, that, that Hobab knows the wilderness. He knows how to survive in the wilderness. As they were beginning to, to leave, Hobab said, well, see you later, brother-in-law. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm going back home. I'm staying here. So Moses begins to plead with them. Again, in, in 1031, and you may be to us in of eyes. You're of great value to us. If you go with us, we'll pay you. How are the Lord's good to us? We'll share with you. And if, you if you're reading, if you're reading your Bible, and I know you do, you say, well, did he stay or did he go? Isn't there a song? That's just... <laughs> I just, that popped my head soon to see that. It doesn't say. It doesn't tell you if he stayed or if, if he stayed and went home or if he went with Moses. Why doesn't it say? Because that's not what's important. God is so efficient. He's so efficient with his words. He doesn't give us useless information. We don't need to know if this man stayed. What we need to know is this offer was made. 
what you need to see if, is that Moses was still having some trouble fully trusting in God. All he'd been through in Egypt with the plagues, living in the wilderness at Mount Sinai with these people for over two years, God had met their every need. He'd fed them with manna from heaven. He watered them from a stone, from a rock water came forth. He split the Red Sea so they could pass. But yet Moses believed that he needed a man of the wilderness for a guide. He had some lingering doubt. You want to see God doing more in your life? Trust him more. You want to see God doing more in your life? Reject the doubt that lives in you. So they begin to travel. By day, they had God's cloud over them, providing them shade from the desert sun. By night, it was a pillar of fire, giving them light and warmth, and the, the desert gets very cold at night. In verse 10, 30, or chapter 10, verse 35, it came to pass in the ark set forward, and Moses said, Rise up, Lord, and let thine enemies be scattered, and let them that hate thee flee before thee. And when it rested, he said, Return, O Lord, unto the many thousands of Israel. This was the Shekinah glory of God. We've talked about it before. It's a manifestation of God's presence. It's his glory, this cloud and his flame. The cloud by day, the fire by night, his Shekinah glory. At all times of the day, visible with his people. Now put your feet in the sandals of some pagan man or woman who was living in the wilderness at that time, and here comes two million people with the presence of God manifested above them, do you think that was intimidating at all? I think it was probably intimidating. So after two years of intense preparation, can you imagine this? These people, these people have been working for two years, following all the detail of the tabernacle, making, making animal skins, putting them together, making gold candle stand, making an altar, doing all this, and they just erect it. God says, let's pick up and let's go. <laughs> let's pick up and let's go. And that right there is where so many people stop. As I said before, some, sometimes God wants to move in someone's life, and they say, this is the most inopportune time. It's like, I just got this set up, God. Let's stay here for a little longer. But they didn't. They, at least in that, they were obedient. I think not only did that go with, with this message, I think it went to Sunday school too. It's amazing when the Spirit moves you like that. Let's, let's pray as we close it. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, again, it's, it's, we're so privileged. We know we're pri privileged. We're privileged as a church, as a people who gather together, but most of all, we're privileged because Jesus Christ has loved us so much to uh, pay such a terrible price for us. And, and Father, we read about these people of Israel and we know how you were using them that, that through that bloodline that Jesus would be del delivered, and we thank you for your love. Father, we, we, we see how you love us. We've heard testimony today of your movement in our lives, and we see how you love us. So, God, help us, give us your Holy Spirit to help us love you back. Help us to love you with a more perfect love. Help us to decide. Help us to decide to love you, Father. In Jesus' most perfect name, amen. Thank you.